do you believe that it's right to call this genocide? This is not the first time that Israel has killed so many people in Palestine. If you go back to 1948, even by the admission of Israeli soldiers now in their 80s and 90s, they committed genocide then. They committed ethnic cleansing then. They were never taken to task. So yes, uh, genocidal acts by Israel have been done historically. And I'm not surprised that they are willing to do them because nobody takes them to task. Speaking of taking them to task, America's president, Joe Biden, is expected to be in Israel on Wednesday. What does he need to say in your mind to alleviate this situation? Well, I don't know. Um, but I, to me, it's mind boggling that there be such an unfair treatment meted out at the Palestinian people who have been suffering, as I said, from 1948 and since the Israeli occupation of the West Bank and Gaza continue to suffer daily killings, home destructions, uprooting olive trees, uh, targeted uh, killings, uh, all of that, uh, concentration camps where, Israel, where Palestinians are incarcerated without uh, legal recourse. All of that is in everybody's uh, eyes, under everybody's nose. And yet, leaders will deal with Israel as, as they see fit. So I, I can't comment on what motivates President Biden to go there or what he will say. If he fails to stop the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians, what in your mind will be the reaction of the Muslim world? Well, it's, it, we'll have to wait and see. And uh, it is not just the Muslim world. I hope it's the whole world. Uh, even in this country, we've heard voices of opposition to what is happening to the Palestinian people. In other countries, in Europe and in else elsewhere, there is a, a popular uh, demand that uh, justice be done for the Palestinians. This is new and this is good, but it is not enough. When you hear the term proportionate response, what is your reaction to that, given the violence we've seen inflicted on Gaza? Well, how proportionate can you be with a bomb that kills 200 people, with a rifle that kills maybe 20 people? For me, one life is, 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 is worth not killing. Uh, you know, there is a verse in the Quran, if you kill one innocent person, it's like killing all of mankind. So, and this was addressed to the Israeli people by God when he was dealing with them in previous times. So uh, that is the value of life. So what is proportionate? Is it uh, one to 10? Is it uh, two to 20? Is it a uh, thousand to 10,000? Loss of life is loss of life. Tell me this, 50 years ago in 1973, your father, along with other OPEC producers, um, decided to push back against the West's um, acceptance of Israeli actions toward the Palestinians. They said enough is enough, there will be an oil embargo. But today the silence is deafening from the Gulf Arab countries. And I'm talking, yes, there have been statements, but nobody has said anything. Does that surprise you? Well, uh, I think you must uh, yani distinguish by what you mean by Gulf leaders. And I think yani, the, the kingdom's position has been very clear, uh, stated to Mr. Blinken when he was there. Not only is, it, is this not acceptable, but things are going to happen that are not going to be happy for anybody uh, as a result of the Israeli aggression against the Palestinian people, no matter how much they justify it with Hamas's actions. I'm no friend of Hamas, but on the other hand, look at the, the, the background. Three quarters of a century of persecution of the Palestinians by the Israelis. And nobody takes any action against that. So something must be done. Do you believe that Saudi Arabia will take some kind of action? Well, I'm not in government, so I cannot tell you what Saudi Arabia is thinking about. But when you look at what happens next, the worry generally is that we're going to see this bleed over into other countries in the region, Egypt, Jordan, and Lebanon. 
do you think that Saudi Arabia should be the one to broker a peace? Well, I think Saudi Arabia will work with those countries, particularly Jordan and, and uh, Egypt, uh, to find any way out of the situation. And uh, they've done it before, as you know, many times. But now I think it has to be a finality must be put to the uh, endless occupation of Palestine by Israel and the consistent killing on both sides. As I said today in pre my, present my presentation, there are no heroes in this conflict. There are only victims. And so we need to stop it. You were a diplomat for many years. What kind of diplomacy is needed? <laughs> well, I'm glad you asked that question because as a diplomat, I was, you know, originally in the intelligence business. And I could see in that uh, uh, work that uh, um, you're always surprised by people's reactions when you least expect it. Um, the, uh, the fact that President Biden has come around to engage with Saudi Arabia and how to broker peace in the Middle East it is a tremendous uh, development in the thinking of President Biden and, and the administration. And I hope that something can be taken up on that between the kingdom and, and President Biden. But Egypt has a role to play as well, and so does Jordan. So Jordan, I think Saudi Arabia and Egypt and other countries in the area will be contributive to any, any formula that can put an end to the bloodletting. Tell me this, uh, Palestinian refugees, everyone, talks about how terrible the situation is for the Palestinians, and yet no one's willing to open their borders to them. In your mind, is that hypocrisy? It's a tough question, morally and politically and um, diplomatically, because if you allow Israel to push these Palestinians for example, out of, out of uh, Gaza. Gaza is mainly a refugee camp and has been since 1948 for, these, for the Palestinian people. So if they're going to be taken in by Egypt or Jordan, that means Israel will have succeeded in cleansing them out of, out of, out of uh, Gaza. So it's a tough issue to face, and uh, countries will have to do what they think is best for them. Forgive me, but that seems a bit of a weak response. Well, it's a weak uh, situation. What can you do? And, uh, are you going to, I don't know, say, OK, open borders. Come on, uh, refugees, you can come to, to the Sinai and, and settle there. Well, they've settled in Gaza because they were driven out of the West Bank and, and other places there, and they didn't go back to their homes. If they go to Sinai, they will not go back to their homes in Gaza. It's, it's a vicious circle that is created by the situation which is really important, which is the occupation that Israel imposes on the West Bank and Gaza. As a financial journalist for over a decade, I tend to look at these situations, these eruptions in the Middle East, and think to myself, follow the money. Earlier today, you made a statement in which you said that you condemned the funneling, um, the Israeli funneling of Qatari money to Hamas. Walk me through what you meant by that. A few years back, uh, Israel, under Netanyahu, I believe, reached an agreement with Qatar that they would allow Qatari support that goes to the Gaza Strip, to Hamas, through Israel. So it's been Israel that is handing out that money to Hamas. At a time when we all know that they've been declaring that Hamas is a terrorist organization. And as you've seen in many writings of people about this, Netanyahu obviously meant to bolster Hamas in the face of the Palestinian Authority so that there will be division between the Palestinians. So he was trying to use Hamas for his own purposes. And now this is what he gets in return. Do you think that we will see um, a peaceful resolution to this situation with Prime Minister Netanyahu still in power, still in government? Is that possible? I have never seen him as a man of peace. Uh, so um, I don't know. Uh, 
as I mentioned in my, in my talk, he's had the most major defeat of his career as a result of Hamas's actions across the border with Gaza. Will he survive that? Will the Israeli people allow him to survive that as prime minister and not bring him to task and, you know, questioning him and, and getting rid of him because of the awful failure that, that resulted from his, uh, from his policy? Yeah. I don't know. If you put this in context, this was essentially Israel's 9-11. Well, I called it Israel's Tet Offensive. Uh, those of you who are old enough to have lived through the Vietnam War will remember that uh, the Tet Offensive in 1968 upended America's uh, stay in Vietnam at a time when President Johnson and General Westmoreland were assuring everybody that the fight is almost over, the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese are defeated, we're going to have our troops back home soon. And here comes this offensive in all the major cities in South Vietnam that shows that the war is not over. So President Johnson ends up not running again. General Westmoreland resigns. Well, maybe that will be the case with Mr. Netanyahu. I don't know. Do you find it troubling that Qatar is currently hosting a spokesman for Hamas? I think anybody who is a spokesman for Hamas is, is troubling, not just Qatar. And to find people who, who can support such an organization, and I've listed in my talk today... Because essentially much, that's like Saudi Arabia hosting Osama bin Laden after 9-11. Well, no? That, as I said, Yanni, I, I find it troubling, of course. And uh, Hamas's activities against the... the, the the Palestinian people is, is well documented uh, how they treated with the Palestinian Authority when they took over in, in, uh, in Gaza in 2006 is well documented. So, uh, as I said, Danny, I'm no friend of Hamas and anybody who provides support to them, I think, should be taken to task as well. What kind of leverage do the Gulf Arab countries have today? when it comes to the situation between Israel and Palestine. And in that sense of, in 1973, you had the weapon of oil to wield. Today, the market is a different market. In your mind, what kind of pressure can be exerted? Well, I think the fact that the, the Gulf states are countries that are living in peace and offering um, development and progress to the rest of, of, the, of the community around us. You know, Saudi Arabia employs more than two million Egyptians in Saudi Arabia. I don't know how many Jordanians work in Saudi Arabia. Uh, literally uh, thousands of Lebanese work in Saudi Arabia. Syrians, the same way. When the Syrian crisis erupted in, in 2012 and there were refugees, uh, crossing borders of Syrian refugees and so on, those who came to Saudi Arabia were not treated as refugees. They were allowed to work in the workplace, to go to school, and enjoy the benefits of the development of Saudi Arabia. Um, from the sub, uh, subcontinent in India, millions of people work there. And that's just Saudi Arabia. If you take and add to that Qatar and the UAE, Kuwait and Bahrain and Oman, there's a huge community of people who work there, and through them, I think the Gulf states can wield influence uh, on those countries around them uh, to the extent of saying, we have much to offer, and we would like you to work with us to improve the situation for all of us. So from that sense, the, the influence of, of, of the Gulf states is from that aspect. It's the, the soft power rather than the military power that the, uh, the Gulf states can wield. You don't foresee an instance where Saudi Arabia and other Gulf oil producers will attempt to use energy as a weapon in the way that it was used back in 1973? Well, as I mentioned in my presentation today, Andy, those times have changed. And in, in, in 1973, uh, there was a tight market for oil uh, and uh, OPEC at the time I think reached something like 75% of oil production worldwide. Today it's in the 30s, if, if I get my figures right. So there is no way that, that oil can be used as, as, a, as a weapons 
by the Gulf states or by OPEC in that sense. The irony here, of course, is that the oil consumers are now using oil as a weapon uh, against Russia, for example. They are embargoing Russian oil. They're trying to put a cap on Russian oil, oil price. Um, President Biden, for example, uses the, uh, the strategic oil reserve to bring down the price of oil, um, etc. So it is now the consumers who are using oil as a, as a weapon. Speaking of, of Russia, do you see Russia benefiting from the crisis in the region? Russia will try to benefit from any crisis in the region. We've seen it benefit, if you remember, when uh, President Obama um, made his uh, red lines about Syria. Uh, and then he abandoned that and, and literally asked Russia to come and take over about the chemical weapons in Syria and so on. So they actually benefit from that uh, at the invitation of President Obama. And uh, nowadays, of course, you know, they will try to show themselves as the champions of the Palestinian people, as we've seen statements made already by Mr. Putin and so on, to ingratiate himself with Arab masses and Muslim masses around the world. So yes, they will try to benefit. Tell me this. When you take a step back and think about how this will potentially evolve, there are big questions about Iran's involvement. They've traditionally backed Hamas and other terrorist organizations in the region, including Hezbollah. Israeli officials have been very, very careful, as have American officials, not to draw direct links as of yet um, from the terror attack in Israel to Iran directly. Saudi Arabia and Iran, a detente brokered by the Chinese. Do you believe that if there is evidence found that they were behind this attack, we will see a change in that relationship between Saudi Arabia and Iran? Let's Does that put start, paid to that let new Let's start by saying yeah, um, Iran threw up its arms and said, hey guys, I had nothing to do with this. And yeah, basically, uh, Mr. Blinken uh, echoes that and says, we have found no evidence that, that Iran is, is, uh, has any links to, to this attack. The Israelis, as you said, have not mentioned Iran as they would have assumably uh, tried to, to do if they had stayed with their policy of antagonism to, to Iran. So all of this is, it makes you wonder, yani, why is Iran being so <laughs> absolved and treated in such a manner when it, this is an opportunity because of its past support for Hamas? Definitely, the armaments that have gone to Hamas have come from Iran. The training for the, the Hamas uh, uh, drone uh, flyers uh, were done by Iran. Uh, the, all the other things that, that Iran presented to, to Hamas to give it its uh, military capabilities are there, and they're not denied by either Hamas or by, by Iran. So yet we find the United States wanting to absolve Iran of, of any responsibility there. Maybe it's because they are in, in talks about the so-called uh, JCPOA number two. I don't know, but uh, it's, it's, it's worrisome because it shows that uh, people who have put their positions at stake on a certain subject before can easily forget those positions when it suits them. What about China? What about China? Because when you think about the, the oil flows coming from the Gulf Arab companies, from Iran as well, the majority of that oil is flowing to Asian markets, to China. There has been an argument made that that kind of influence, now wielded by the Gulf countries with Beijing, could actually be used um, to alleviate, to grease the wheels, if you will, um, when Washington and Beijing don't see eye to eye. Well, even there, yeah, the, uh, Iran is, is producing more oil because America lets them produce more oil. They've lifted some of the sanctions uh, on, on American, on uh, Iranian sales. A cynic oil. might say that, that it's directly linked to America's decision, at least thus far, not to cast uh, more questioning eyes toward Tehran over this attack. Well, maybe, maybe. I cannot, uh, I cannot uh, divine what American motives are. But China's motives, obviously, is to get as much oil as they can on any market as cheaply as they can. So yes, they will buy Iranian oil because it's cheaper and it is available. 
Uh, they're buying Russian oil because it is cheaper and it is, uh, it is available. And they're buying Saudi and Kuwaiti and Qatari and Emirati, etc. So, yes, they will seek what is best for them. But even among on the Palestinian issue, they're also trying to ingratiate themselves with the, with the passions and the feelings of the Arab world in, this, in the face of the uh, Israeli occupation of Palestine. In many of our conversations, we've talked about um, the looming crisis uh, for the Middle East. Um, and, you know, oftentimes people will say it's Iran. Um, others will say it has to do with economics and with oil. And you have consistently told me through the years that it has to do with the unresolved situation between Palestine and Israel, an unresolved situation um, for the Palestinian people. To your mind, are we closer now to finding some kind of resolution? in the wake of these attacks? Well, there is an Arab saying, a crisis reach its peak, maybe it will subside after that. Um, or some such translation of it, bad translation. Uh, the Palestinian issue has been with us for even more than three quarters of a century, even before the creation of, of, of Palestine. I don't see anybody in, who can do something about it, and I address this particularly to the United States, with the willingness to pay the price politically for doing something that will re put an end to this conflict, mainly the implementation of United Nations resolutions on Palestine. Well, there are several. General Assembly resolutions and Security Council resolutions that are left there hanging in the air without implementation. If only the United States can push for the implementation of those resolutions, I think we can reach a solution. Do you believe President Biden will be able to accomplish that? I don't know. But this is, what, this is my wish. And if he is willing to pay the price politically for that, um, sure. Any president would be, should be willing to, to pay the price for reaching peace because, as, as we've seen, Yani, yeah, this situation is not going to go away by ignoring it. You have to put finality to it. You can't simply manage it or accept that it is an irreconcilable uh, difference between two different peoples, the, the Arabs and the Israelis. And to your mind, only the United States has the power to put this right? I hope so. <laughs> yani, yeah, that's... You tell me. You're from the United States. And I don't know if, if the American political system will allow that or not. Your Royal Highness, thank you so much for joining the entry. Thank you. Thank you.